Dr. Johnson was elevated to a godlike status. Due to the media explosion, people associated their freedom from pain and unrest with him, and Ezra Corp became the unofficial capital of this new world people found themselves in. Johnson ate it all up. He started wearing robes and allowing his followers to adorn him with floral wreaths. He felt the elation, but secretly, he saw that it wasn't as intense as the euphoria his followers felt. He concluded that since the virus he had created originated from him, it didn't have as strong as an effect. He was glad because if he was going to leave these people, at least his euphoria would be a little more subtle so he could make level-headed decisions. Just as he was considering how serendipitous this was, he heard commotion outside the office. He could hear Richard's voice yelling from outside the office door. I don't want you to cough on me. I just want to talk to Johnson. Johnson opened the door to find three of his followers all coughing on Richard's, trying to pass the virus. He had never seen Richard so aggravated. He had a furious look in his face, as if his fight-or-flight response was about to kick in. If I opened this door a second later, thought Johnson, Richards would have been swinging at these people. Richards looked up to see Johnson, rushed towards him, and pushed him into his office. Then he slammed the door and locked it behind him. You have to help me stop this, said Richards. It isn't too late. We can make an antidote. Antidote, said Johnson, affronted. Look, I can't do this without you. You made this thing, and you can help me stop it. You're obviously not affected, and will... Yes, I am, said Johnson defensively. I feel great. It's a brave new world, and I'm at the head. The virus just didn't change my biochemistry as effectively since the bug came from me, but... It didn't affect you at all, Frank, Richard shouted. Now, I can see it in your eyes. You're not infected. Help me clean up this mess you made, damn it. The smile went away from Johnson's face. He noted how good it felt when he did this. His muscles had been hurting from all this smiling. Mess, said Richards. People are happy for once. I've just put an end to suffering as we know it. I'm not stopping this. You're just jealous because I made the right play and have taken credit where credit is due. Frank, listen to yourself. You're not a scientist. You're a damn cult leader. Did you ever stop to think that people need suffering? Pain? Hurt? Misery? They're not the enemies here. People's brains aren't your playground. Jealous, said Johnson. Jealous and petty. You're just a miserable little soul that will soon be extinct. You're a dinosaur, Richards, and you're not welcome here. Johnson opened the door and calmly told his followers to take Dr. Richards away, and until he learned what love was, he was not allowed back on the premises. The next morning, Johnson held a press conference in the lobby, right in front of the statue of himself. There was a huge crowd of people there, and it was being broadcast across the world. There was a sea of people outside in the parking lot. They had set up outdoor speakers and huge television screens, which broadcasted Johnson's image. As he got up to the podium, people cheered, gasped, and threw flowers at him. He raised his hands to quiet everyone. My friends, he began, we have entered a new world of love and compassion. People began to cheer and praise uproariously. This is the dawn of a new era for human beings. The intensity of the applause grew. This is the first step out of the darkness and into the light. The crowd was now at fever pitch. It was at this moment that the crowd died down, waiting for Johnson's next line, that the virus took its first victim. A 35-year-old man to the left of the podium was cheering without abandon, past the point when the crowd stopped. He kept cheering until he went into frantic convulsions and fell onto the floor. Foam started streaming out of his smiling mouth as he went catatonic. Johnson looked at him in horror, speechless. Just then, everyone started applauding, and people gathered around the comatose man in order to embrace him. The crowd figured that this was the climactic conclusion to the speech, so no one noticed Dr. Johnson when he slipped away from the podium, ducked behind the curtains, and started to vomit. What is going on, he thought. That must have been a freak accident. It couldn't have been the virus, could it? He walked back up to his office for some privacy, but by the time he got up there and looked out his window into the parking lot, he saw that there were at least five other people with foam coming out of their mouths, going into convulsions. Three of these people were being crowded around by the others, all rushing in to embrace them. Two of them were hoisted by the crowd and were being passed around. People kept cheering and praising in an orgy of joy. This isn't happening, said Johnson. This isn't supposed to happen. I'll fix this. I can fix this. And he rushed down into the lab and frantically got to work. The first step, he thought, would be to take a sample of an infected person. He ripped open a syringe from its package and quickly took a sample of his own blood. He put that blood on a slide and put the slide under a microscope. He couldn't believe what he saw. His blood was clean. This can't be, he said aloud. He was having trouble comprehending this. Had he been lying to himself about how he was feeling? Had his feelings of joy and happiness just been an illusion? Did he convince himself that he was infected only because he wanted it to be true? He was still the same miserable person that he had always been. He felt a large crushing weight of this realization come down on him. 
It felt like a black hole opened in his chest and he crumpled to the ground. His voice choked. What have I done? What have I done? The world was falling apart. People all over the world were falling into a blissful state of catatonia. Others who didn't fall victim to deadly seizures were turned into a sort of zombie, drooling at the mouth from their large smiles, walking stiffly with their arms outstretched, too preoccupied with their overwhelming state of euphoria to comprehend the dire situation that they found themselves in. Food wasn't being delivered, power plants were failing all over, and modern society's infrastructure was quickly decomposing. It was too much for the uninfected to handle. There wasn't enough manpower or expertise to keep the ball rolling. Some tried to join together to retain some semblance of a working community, but most people were so full of fear that they held up in their houses, barricading their doors, and threatened to shoot anyone who came near. Many of these people felt that they were experiencing the rapture. Dr. Richards had not given up. He had found a small group of competent people and gathered supplies in order to execute the only plan that he could see working. Him and his ragtag group of uninfected were going to raid the labs of Ezra Corp. They discussed his plan in an abandoned house over candlelight. There was no power, and they didn't dare make a fire because they knew from experience that the roaming bands of drooling infected would be attracted to it like moths to a flame. They would sneak into Ezra Corp, and while five of them searched the premises for Dr. Johnson, Dr. Richards would make his way into the lab and find any research that they could use to reverse the virus. Richards still felt that people could be saved, but they would have to act quickly before people starved or went catatonic. He explained to his makeshift band of mercenaries that Dr. Johnson still may be able to help fix this problem. Little did Richards know that his comrades weren't looking for Dr. Johnson to help save the world, but to exact revenge for his part of destroying it. They grabbed their gear and started on their way. After an hour of stealthily making their way to the gates of Ezracorp, they were ready to put their plan in action. The five snuck around the side of the building to a service entrance while Richards made his way through the front lobby. Richards kept in the dark and slipped through the broken glass of an empty doorway into the lobby. He tried hard to be silent, but there was too much glass on the ground and the crunching slivers echoed in the large space. He took a moment to slowly wipe off the glass from the bottom of his shoes. It was around this time that he made it to the edge of the fountain at the foot of the statue. At first, he heard a noise. He stopped and heard some rustling come from the darkness ahead of him. Then to his side, he heard some labored breathing, followed by some dull laughing. Just then, into the light stepped a drooling, grinning face that lit up upon seeing Richards. Richards quickly turned where he stood to go back towards the open doorway. But as he did, he heard the crunching of glass. A large group of figures with outstretched arms were silhouetted against the night sky. Seeing his only exit blocked, he panicked. Before he could think of what to do, someone grabbed him from behind in a tight embrace, and then another, then another. He struggled to get free, and as he did, he felt drool and foam hit the back of his neck and head. He knocked a couple of arms away. By the time he did, the infected that came from the entrance were already on top of him. There were too many. He was being suffocated by smiling, blissful bodies rushing to embrace him. The more he kicked and swung, the tighter they grabbed until he couldn't breathe. The only thing he could think left to do was scream. Dr. Johnson was in his lab when he heard a scream, and he looked up from his work. He ran out into the hallway to see what had happened, but when he did, he was met by five angry faces. He had never been so happy to see such furious people. Boyd, Dr. Johnson said, am I glad to see you. And the last image Dr. Johnson saw was one of those angry faces pulling out a gun and holding it to his temple.